Chapter 9. The Pregnancy The agency arranged for my surrogate to fly to the clinic two days before the embryo transfer, and I decided to go and meet her. It was so emotional and a true privilege to spend time together. It felt surreal to think that I was with the person that was about to carry my babies. Then, on the 17th of January 2012, two of the six embryos that had been made were transferred into her. I still to this day remember how surreal, exciting, and overwhelming it was. Even now, I can't really put into words just how huge it felt. It was what I had dreamed of for as long as I could remember, and yet I also knew that it might not work. The next day, my surrogate flew home to Arizona, and I flew to Los Angeles to spend a few days relaxing with one of my friends to escape from the reality of the previous few weeks. I hadn't told her what was going on, so it gave me the opportunity to focus on something other than the embryo transfer. On the 20th of January, we were at a brunch and a nurse called. I remember exactly what she said. Don't get too excited. However, the blood hormone level is 199, which is a very early indicator that you might be pregnant. We will do another test in seven days' time and confirm back to you the new level. I burst into tears and of course had to then spill the beans on the past few months. Once I had stopped crying, I was stunned and thrilled. It seemed to have worked, and yet a little voice in my head asked, why did she say not to get too excited? The level she was talking about was to do with HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, which is a hormone released by the body when the embryo implants, and if the number increases, it shows that the embryo is growing, and the transfer had worked. A week later, I received another call, and the HCG had risen, and it continued to rise, and before I knew it, the six-week scan was upon us. This was the real test, as this is an ultrasound where the nurses look for a heartbeat. By this stage, I was back home in London, and I spent the whole day nervously waiting for a call, and then at 10am Arizona time, my phone rang. My heart nearly stopped. The ultrasound showed two very quick and strong heartbeats, which meant twins. Everything I had hoped for and dreamed of was happening. Flying from London to the US for all the scans was just not an option financially. However, the 20-week scan was one that I was not going to miss. This is the anatomy scan to check to see if the babies were growing correctly and where I could find out the sex of the twins. When we entered the scan room, the technician was very aloof and cold. When the images started to appear, the surrogate and I started to hug and cry tears of joy, and the technician's demeanour changed as she could see that this was a warm and kind relationship. She asked if we wanted to know the sex of the twins, which was answered very quickly with a yes please, and very excitedly she said, you're having a boy and a girl. More tears. How incredibly exciting the dream was coming true. Surrogates normally give birth in the hospital where they've had their own children. However, for my twins, I randomly had a friend who is an obstetrician in Phoenix, and we agreed to work with her. Why did I want to work with my friend? I had an inherent feeling of not being accepted as I was gay, and therefore I was concerned that we would be treated differently because gay dads in Arizona having a surrogate birth I voiced this to my friend. She said there would be no issues at all, and she gave me comfort that it was all going to be okay. The surrogacy agency is also involved in making sure that the team around the babies who deliver, register, and deal with all of the hospital finances know that this is a surrogacy arrangement, which ensures no additional worries. The agency arranged a private room for us that was next to where the surrogate would be, so that we could be just us as a new family in our room, and to be there for our surrogate for whatever she needed in her room. What a weight lifted from my shoulders. Living in the UK and not seeing the weekly changes as the babies were growing was hard. Sometimes it felt like it wasn't happening, and it was only on paper that someone, somewhere, was pregnant with my children. Emotionally, this was hard for me. This was my first pregnancy and I wanted to be as involved as I could. I also realised that the surrogate was not at my beck and call, and so we had to find a balance of emailing once a week and a call every two weeks. 
As we got closer to the birth, this changed to speaking every week. Finally, at 37 weeks, on the 12th of September 2012, we were all in the hospital in Phoenix, and after a scheduled C-section, at 5.28pm and 5.30pm, my miracle twins, Alexander and Liliana, made it into this world. The most magical moment of my life. I pinch myself every single day that this was possible. My children know it took a lot of people and a lot of love to bring them into this world. Five questions to ask. Number one, is your contact with the surrogate too little, too much, or okay? Find out if she thinks the same. Number two, if you have an experienced surrogate, find out what she liked and didn't like from her previous surrogacy pregnancy and follow her lead on this. Number three, does the hospital where your baby is going to be born have a history of dealing with surrogacy cases? Number four, is your agency in touch with the hospital to make sure that everyone is aware of the surrogacy arrangement? Number five, does the hospital have a private room for you for before and after the birth? If you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about IVF and surrogacy, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, please share and follow our social media handle at IVF Daddies. We are here to answer any questions and to guide you through this very personal process.